Welcome to Playing With Fire, the podcast for people who are ready to custom build their love. We're talking about non-monogamy, however you design it, as an individuation opportunity. Want to leave the default and make your life spectacularly you? You're in the right place. Hello, Marie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to finally get to talk to you and to Ken. Welcome. It's yeah. So when you say finally, I'm like, yes, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Marie is an expert in something that that feels like to me just the the absolute match to my own research. And I talk about my research all the time on our podcast. I'm a jealousy researcher. So would you tell our audience exactly what you study and why? you picked this area of study. Mm, Absolutely. So I study the phenomenon of compersion in consensually non-monogamous relationships. And compersion, for those who might not have heard the term, is um, basically the opposite of jealousy. It's the idea of being empathetically joyful for somebody somebody else's joy. And specifically in the context of non-monogamy, where you would be feeling joyous for your partner's other relationships where they're experiencing joy. Um, and I'm saying finally, because you did the TED, uh, the TEDx talk on that, which I thought was absolutely fabulous. And oh, I was like, thank wow, you. thank you for doing that and spreading the word. Well, you and I have something in common. We have yeah. both lobbied uh, Miriam Webster oh. for including compersion in the dictionary. And I was met with pretty much the same response you were, which is, oh, people aren't using that word yet. You know, like, it's just Mm -hmm. not, but how are we going to use it if we don't use it? (laughs) It's a a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I'm happy to say I created a a website called whatiscompersion.com based on my research, and it's getting so many hits. I think people are really interested in that area, like I'm getting 5,000 unique visitors a month. So that tells you how thirsty folks are for that concept and how we really need a word for that in the English language. Yes, you're right. We do. And so tell us in your, in your research, like, each of us, I believe, is pulled to our research for a reason. Mm-hmm. Why did you pick compersion? Ah, such a good question. Um, I've always been really interested in intentional relationships. My own family structure was very non-traditional. So my parents decided to have me. They had, they had decided to have a kid, but they didn't want to get married and they didn't want to live under the same roof. So from a very young age, I started realizing that there was a lot of freedom to be found in how we create our families, how we create our relationships, and we don't have to abide by the norm or by the default mode of, you know, either it is monogamy or heteronormativity or the relationship escalator where, you know, there's this sequence of events that are just assumed once you decide that you're into someone and that it's mutual, like you will, of course, end up living under the same roof and having children together and getting married, like this kind of default mode of relating. Yeah. So, of course, I became really interested in consensual non-monogamy because I also felt like I was not naturally a very monogamous person. And when it came time to study psychology, that was really the thing that I wanted to study because... I knew there was a a lack of research in that area. And specifically the word compersion, when I came across that word, I, you know, it's like my mind was blown. I was like, wow, this is the epitome of the paradigm that I want to live in. This is really symbolizing the kind of love that I feel like I have in the best case scenarios where I don't want to control people I love. I want to actually let them be the full expression of who they are. Yeah. And that can include them wanting to engage romantically with other people. Oh, I, yeah. I love it's, that answer. And yeah. I think it's similar to your answer. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it <laughs> makes me ask a question, which is where did you first run across the word compersion? 
it was in a conference, I think in 2012 or 2013 in Berkeley, California. It was called the Conference for the Future of Monogamy and Non-Monogamy. Mm -hmm. And I think someone gave a workshop about it or, you know, I just remember seeing the word in the pamphlet and wondering like, well, what is this? And I Googled it and I understood what it was and I just fell in love with the concept. And that also, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say it, it, suck, it is a concept that people fall in love with mm -hmm. and that I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I also think, wow, people fall in love with it and then they can get into a little bit of a paradox, right? About like trying to move toward compersion and mm. somehow erase or cure or fix jealousy. Mm. And I'm guessing you and I agree on this, that that's not necessarily a really productive way to think about compersion and jealousy. Exactly, exactly. That is a trap, really, when people either put that expectation on themselves, like, oh, compersion exists, I should be feeling compersion in right. every single situation right and and they put that expectation on their partner oftentimes like you should be feeling compersion for me in my relationships like you owe me compersion or that's just like something that becomes an expectation and therefore something that doesn't always fit reality in the context yeah and i called that um the myth of the good poly person mm -hmm. in in my dissertation and i I really feel like it is one of the biggest hindrances to furthering the amount of compersion. Like if we could somehow mm. quantify compersion, we can't, mm. but if we could, and we wanted to raise the amount of it there was, mm -hmm. it does feel like we're moving in the wrong direction when we, when we layer in expectation, oh. especially of our partners, but also of ourselves. Right. So right. why does, why is compersion so important then like you work with people who are mm -hmm. attempting to to move in this intentional way in their relationships mm -hmm. which i love in particular i hear you talk so well about dating mm -hmm. which whether you're dating monogamously or or non-monogamously like it can be rough out there yes why is compersion impo an important concept to add in mm -hmm. well you know, at a very base level, compersion, you know, like is the idea that we're not separate and that we're not in competition with one another. Um, so philosophically, it has a lot of, you know, importance. Like it's actually um, in Buddhism considered one of the four qualities of the enlightened person. The, the Sanskrit word for it is mudita. Yeah. And that idea can be applied to every life situation, not just romantic partners and dating. So, you know, it's the idea that because we're not really actually separate or not in competition, your joy can be my joy. So just to, you know, like wrap our head around that idea can go a long way to help us alleviate some situations where we just have this jealousy, comparison, envy, impulse. Mm -hmm. That's it. When yeah, the comparison. Comparison. So uh, that's such an obstacle to compersion and for that matter, empathy. Right. I, so in my work, because I'm often talking to people about jealousy, one of the first things I do is sort it from envy and, mm. and try to help people like, right, pull it apart. And yet what I've noticed is that compersion is a nice um, medicine, if you will. <laughs> it's a nice addition to both. Like, because, it, because compersion can help us um, intellectually, at least, con consider, are we actually in competition? Are we in comparison mode? Because that's where envy lives, right? Mm -hmm. So whether we're talking about that romantic jealousy where we're afraid of the love of our beloved being taken from us, or we're talking about envy when we wish we were like someone, either way, like, it's almost like we could point compersion at ourselves at that point and say, mm. I'm going to be happy for all of myself and mm. all of myself and not just try to be this one narrow thing. I wow. The, the link between compersion and self-acceptance, I've never really seen it that yeah. way before. Yeah. Mm. Compersion. I can be happy for you because I'm happy for me and I'm mm. happy with where I am. It makes it easier. Uh, and, wow. That's just a new thought for me. <laughs> so where do you find people are struggling with compersion when they show up in your in your space in your coaching mm -hmm. space what's going on for them well 
it's all kinds of different reasons. And that's where my research is super useful. You know, my research was with non-monogamous folks and it identified what are the factors that promote conversion versus what are the factors that hinder conversion. That's perfect. And I know it's so helpful. Not again, like to cycle back to the last comments about like setting an expectation that we should always be feeling conversion. Like, no, that's not the idea. But when we have an understanding of what promotes conversion, naturally speaking, in our context, in our in our ecosystems of relationships, mm. then we are able to identify where we can perhaps create some positive changes that will naturally promote more conversion. So that's really the idea of promoting more relationship satisfaction and harmony in those relationships as well. And some of the main blocks to conversion are, you know, at the individual level where maybe someone doesn't have self-acceptance or self-esteem or self-security within themselves. And they already have a strong fear that they are replaceable or not desirable or not beautiful for that matter like there's a lot of content at the individual level that would prevent someone from feeling quote-unquote generous or at ease with their partner being with somebody else yeah so that's number that's, one that's a big hindrance so let's draw mm-hmm. attention to that because I so I I trained as a Jungian psychologist so that means I I take a sort of individuation tactic to almost mm. anything oh, and yeah. so when I think about relationship work Mm -hmm. often I find people they want to work on that the space in between and it's super Mm -hmm. important I do Mm -hmm. want to work on the space between I and thou and Mm -hmm. there's so much to be done in our individual work and I think it's the place I see people missing missing an opportunity right we we get into a spot where we're jealous or we're or we're overwhelmed or we're even just imagining a situation then we're like preemptively jealous Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we forget that it starts here. It starts within. It starts with me, because and and such an opportunity. Mm-hmm. I get to work with me. If it's in the space in between, I might need to get engagement from my partner. But when it's my stuff, it's just such an empowering place. When I'm struggling with compersion, that's the place I try to get back to as quickly as I can. Like, what's in here for me on my self worth? Like you said, that self love mm-hmm. and acceptance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's an un- yeah. unending amount of work that can be done yes yes absolutely I mean I think the lack of compersion can shine quite a flashlight on the places where you know maybe there isn't as much self-love as there can be or you know sometimes it's a relational thing maybe it shines light on where there's not enough love and inclusion in the ecosystem so I, I wrote a blog actually called Use Compersion as a Flashlight, Not as a Stick. Oh, Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I like that Not as a that stick image. to beat yourself with. Right, yourself, your partner. You said, you said before, there's like, there can be this um, pressure that we put on some partners. Like, why can't you feel compersive for me? Why can't you? Mm-hmm. A thing that comes up when people step into my room is often, I just don't understand why they can't transform their jealousy into compersion. Mm-hmm. Mm. you must have something to say to that I know I do yes 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 um yeah that's kind of a flawed concept like you know you don't really transform jealousy into compersion I mean hopefully you can heal some jealousy and make room for conversion. Yeah. that would be more accurate to the reality of it like when you kind of disarm some of the power that the jealousy might have over you and that is a process that's both individual and relational then there can be compersion to naturally grow it's almost like you're you know wanting to cultivate compersion in a garden but you have to have space for it oh i love that again the image the image Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you um when you think about this as a as growing I, i don't know whether you would conceptualize it this way the concept of mudita is ancient it's you know in the in the realm of human experience this is a very old concept and often when i'm talking about compersion people think about it as oh this is like a new thing Mm -hmm, but but i love that you in your research i was reading through your dissertation you make a very clear argument 
that this is a core aspect of a philosophy that goes way back. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's not some newfangled thing we have to learn. There's something more essential going on here. Right. Right. And people feel compersion all the time, you know, like when they look at their kid opening up a gift or they look at, you know, someone they love getting married or getting a great, you know, just great experiences. Like we inherently have the ability to feel happy with others. Yeah. And we just have been raised in a society that tells you you can't be happy for a partner when it has to do with romantic engagement with somebody else like that's a no no that's not how you should feel that's not how you can feel like it's impossible yeah according to the mononormative paradigm right and it might even be the number one thing that blocks understanding between those who feel comfortable with monogamy and those who feel the like a natural comfort with non-monogamy it's almost like there's just a like a, a communication barrier there because yes, if you sir. if you feel just... like there should be a like jealousy is necessary in order to prove that the love is real like and i think yeah i it seems like one of the 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 misconceptions is as as you were saying marie that um the idea of transforming jealousy into compersion is a flawed concept somebody coming in and saying um but i would feel jealous so i couldn't do that Mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. missing the point that you can feel jealous and compersive at the same time yes yeah absolutely thank you for bringing thing. that up yeah, yeah. And, and that is the thing we hear uh, people say is yeah i couldn't do that right yeah it, it's such a common it, a especially when they're new it's a new idea did you find anything in your research that just solidified that idea that like compersion and jealousy they, they can be both opposite but also not they're not mutually exclusive or inclusive right there mm -hmm. what did you find in the actual research yeah thank you for asking because that's right that's such a big myth that they should be mutually exclusive and that's not true like people in consensually non-monogamous relationships typically feel jealousy and compersion sometimes at the same exact time right. sometimes at different times or in different relationships there might be more compersion for one relationship less compersion or more jealousy for another for a different context um so it's super important to normalize jealousy yeah normalize that's... jealousy <laughs> yes yeah that's one of my um I, like that's a hill i'm willing to to die on i'm <laughs> and jealousy is just so core to my work i actually accidentally tattooed the symbol for jealousy on my back. So 12 what? years, be like before I knew, yeah. At the very <laughs> beginning of my non-monogamy journey, I tattooed the kanji symbol for zeal, which of oh. course is the Greek root of jealous. Oh my god! On my back, yeah, before I was wow. studying psychology. And so obviously it follows me everywhere. Oh. But there, the when, so when I was introduced to the word compersion, it was, it was like finding out that there was another whole, uh, it was like finding out that there was another whole sun in the sky. There was another, like, mm. oh, there's mm. another thing. And mm. for me, it wasn't that it was easy to achieve. It wasn't that I just naturally, like, oh, I feel naturally. You have felt, you have described some more natural compersion, Ken. And I, when I say natural, I mean, like, it just spontaneously erupts for you. Whereas I have to really foster compersion. Did you, did you find that in your research that some people seemed to come at it from different directions? Yes, yes, absolutely. For some people, it is a very spontaneous occurrence. And I've even met a couple people, and that's really not the majority, but they are saying that they don't feel like they have the jealous gene. Yeah. And they've never really felt much, much jealousy. So that's interesting, but that's a very small minority. I would say that most people do have to work a little harder on fostering it. And again, it's really dependent on context. Sometimes, you know, it's easy for them to feel compersion in one relationship in one context where maybe they don't feel very threatened and they feel like they don't have much to lose, perhaps. Like it, there's so many factors. That's and it. Then, like power differential can certainly add in, right? Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. I if there's a huge power disparity, 
And the person has a lot of power specifically in your life, like financial or Mm -hmm. like all of a sudden, of course it could be like that just logically makes sense. Yeah. But then in your heart, like (laughs) even if something logically makes sense and we're like, oh, I can see why this would be hard for me. Mm -hmm. We still Mm -hmm. might get that stick out and start beating ourselves up for not spontaneously feeling or for not being one of those people, those exceptions to the rule who just don't really feel a lot of jealousy. Right. Did you? you... Yeah, I get a lot of people in my coaching practice who come to me and they're like, hey, we decided to open our relationship. My partner is feeling compersion. They don't have any problem. And I'm here suffering and, and, and really feeling a lot of jealousy. Like, am I not normal? Right. And of course, they are (laughs) normal. I, uh, the reason I, I feel so strongly about this is because for me, I, I study jealousy as an archetypal pattern. Therefore, mm-hmm. of course it's normal. Mm-hmm. And we're, and we, we cannot rid the world of it. Mm-hmm. What we can do is learn to work with it differently. And compersion invites in this other energy that my, um, when I was giving that TEDx, I was mm-hmm. practicing the speech like a billion times. And mm-hmm. my youngest was um, 12 at the time. And I remember he heard it, I don't know, for the thousandth time. And he finally mm-hmm. heard it because, you know, <laughs> he was a 12 year old boy and he finally heard it and he stood up and he said, mom, I'm so glad you just taught me that word, which is funny. Like I had never mentioned it before, but I'm so glad you taught me that word because if I didn't have a word for it, I wouldn't know where to aim at. Wow. Wow. Like, oh <laughs> yeah. Because if you didn't know the word happy, mm-hmm. sad would be your default. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. He blew my mind. That's a big thing. And I, and so I think about that all the time. Like when Mm -hmm. we're introducing the idea of compersion for me, it's not about like a goal to achieve, but Mm -hmm. it's an, it's a, it's it's an invitation to like, Oh, there could be something yummy too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So what did you find promoted then? So again, I mean, so whatever, promotes it is the opposite of what hinders it and there's like three categories of factors there's the individual factors the relational factors and the social factors Mm. so within the individual factors there's you know we talked about self-security and um, there's also just like a a mindset like there's people who really want to be non-monogamous and there's people who have been dragged into it and don't really want it Yep. Maybe so, a coercion going on, which we have to really check about. Mm-hmm. Yep. Exactly. So these are the two factors that will, you know, either promote or hinder it. So if you're talking about what promotes it, like having great self security and self care, like having a full plate, so to speak, like feeling really resourced emotionally and, you know, in, in your bodily, physical, regular life. Yeah. Um, and also having a frame of mind that is very um, committed to CNM consensually non-monogamous values and, and really wanting to do that. Yeah. Wanting yeah. to. Mm-hmm. It, it's a choice. I mean, we both opted into this yeah. and at the same time, it does feel very um, native to my body. It, do, it does feel that way. And at the same time, I recognize that it's also a choice. Like we've dipped our toe in monogamy as well mm-hmm. and, and explored there. Uh-huh. And it's the freedom to choose between the, these things that aren't actually opposites, right? <laughs> right? The freedom to choose leaves me at least feeling really safe, mm. safe to be able to ask for what I need or just to be even able to say, this is really uncomfortable. It still aligns with my values. And it's uncomfortable. (laughs) Yes. And I want to ask you more about like what you did to promote it, to cultivate it. Yeah. Yeah. Cultivating is the, I love the word. And you gave the image earlier of the garden Mm -hmm. making Mm -hmm. space. For me, it is almost entirely about making space. It's Mm -hmm. about weeding the garden, (laughs) like creating Mm -hmm. actual space by taking out the stuff that doesn't fuel me. Mm-hmm. And that's really hard for me to do. I'm a doer, like mm-hmm. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm an accomplisher. I'm guessing you are too. There's a lot of like, let me do the next thing. Mm-hmm. And when I'm, when my cup is runneth over and it's all mm-hmm. wonderful, 
That's mm-hmm. great. Mm-hmm. But also I usually feel too tapped out to make space to cultivate like the, the interesting feelings that come up when he's on a date or he's out and I'm left with a mix of feelings and I have to choose if I'm tapped out already Mm -hmm. really hard to do that so I have to weed the garden I have to really allow myself margins enough so that I'm like I'm safe I'm safe in my body Mm. I'm safe in my love I'm safe in myself right what about you Ken what do you what do you do because he he has more spontaneous compersion um yeah I do have more spontaneous compersion but I've also spent a lot of time in my life being fairly entitled and selfish <laughs> and so That's wanting true. things for myself. So one of the ways I actually nurture compersion in myself is to remember that um, I, I'm just one of the people around. Mm-hmm. Not, I don't have to be like the most important person. I don't have to focus on me all the time. And sometimes it's just relaxing to look at what somebody else's experience is. Oh, you're having a good time. Great. And just to stop thinking about myself for a little bit. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so uh, it's, you know, it's a novel concept, right? Uh, <laughs> and I mean, I'm, I'm very much of the middle age. Well, you're a 55 year old white full. Yeah. I've gotten full support from the patriarchy my whole life. Mm-hmm. And that leaves me in a very privileged position. And, um, the more aware I am of that privileged position, the easier it is for me to look around and say, okay, but what what are the experiences of the people around me? Oh, that's a good experience, awesome. And Mm -hmm. I'm not even thinking in that moment of what my experience is. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I'll get back to it. You know, I'm not worried about forgetting about it (laughs) because I'm not gonna forget about me. but it, it's actually from, from that privileged position, it actually feels so much better to reach out and say, what's going on? Mm. Um, so one of the ways I nurture that in me is to remind myself to look around. That, I, you know, that reminds me that in your work, I saw that you, you make a point of reminding people that this is, you know, empathetic joy, empathic joy. It's mm. not that it's not, um, using the same skills people have for empathy yeah and just pointing them in a maybe a direction that they haven't thought about before. versus feeling full-on i feel joyful and if i don't feel joyful i will feel jealous (laughs) yeah thinking okay so what's going on over there and how would i feel and that can take a couple extra steps beyond just you like when you see a happy you know toddler yeah, most easy. of us are just like oh my god that's so cute <laughs> without easy. that explosion of joy it can it can be a, a, a conscious intentional act to say what are they probably feeling oh that's mm-hmm. nice mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right which i think is a good segue to get back to those relational factors mm-hmm. because when we are feeling into our partners at our relationship you know it might not be all great and rainbows and butterflies you know like one of the factors in that relational category is just you know having safety and security with your partner Mm -hmm. but another one is also to have positive regard and positive connection towards your metamors who are your partner's partners and if you feel that perhaps the metamor is not treating your partner well or there's something not just completely beautiful and inclusive and, you know, something that you want to support happening in that relationship, then naturally you're probably not going to feel compersion or you're going to feel less of it. Yeah. That's a, I, that seems like a good place for people to take action. That feels like one of those spots where not that you necessarily need to change it, but you could take action. Well, am I, you could get reflective about what do I mean? I don't like what's going on in that relationship. Mm-hmm, what, mm-hmm. Is this, is this actually a cover? Like that, is that judgment a cover for just a, mm-hmm. a basic insecurity in myself? Or is mm-hmm. that judgment because that relationship operates differently than mine. And because it's different, I am making judgments about it. 
Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. when you have had, you had a, a relationship with someone once who was more in like a, a don't ask, don't tell situation. Mm-hmm. And I struggled a lot with my jealousy. I struggled to find mm-hmm. compersion because it, it was so different. I really had to, I really had to clear away a lot of nonsense mm-hmm. in myself because I was making mm-hmm. it about me mm-hmm. when she was happy with her situation. She liked it that way. Right. But I needed to remember that it wasn't, it didn't need to be the same for it to be healthy. It didn't need to be the same for it to be good. Right. Challenging. It can, it can be hard to have empathy with someone that you just don't understand. Like my right. values are different from that. I wouldn't <laughs> feel that way, but I see you do. So now it's a mental game that's hard to tie in the, the feelings. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Like empathy is about moving towards and, you know, really like understanding what's going on. And if there seems to be this wall, and I understand though why it would be harder to feel compersion in the context of a don't ask, don't tell policy, because that, you know, will inherently create some, I guess, like less communication within the polycule. Exactly. That's exactly mm-hmm. it. It was, mm-hmm. it felt like a little bit of erasure. Like there could, like, like there was mm-hmm. almost a, 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 there was a block to full transparency. And I remember responding to the to her don't ask, don't tell policy for herself by not sharing much of my side, which I would want to, but I, like I just automatically sort of aligned myself with what she was doing. Like, okay, that doesn't actually align with my values. Mm. It's an interesting little- But it plays out experience. over time. There's, I think when we talk about compersion, um, I think people hope that it'll just spring up, that it'll just happen mm. and that it'll be consistent. But I'm mm-hmm. guessing that you found that it's more of a, a more of an ebb and flow. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I found in my own research as well, is that people were not consistently cons- compersive, mm-hmm. but they were, it just, it shifted and changed. What did you find? Well, I found that there's two kinds of compersion. And one is an attitudinal, more cognitive compersion, like it's more of an attitude that says like I support you I support your relationships I support your happiness and that just kind of you know as a blanket statement or attitude that makes me happy whatever you do that makes you happy but there's also the embodied compersion Mm -hmm. which is like wow like you're experiencing this joy I am so thrilled and I want the details because that's like turning me on or just making me so happy and ecstatic like that's a a more um that's a a a type of compersion that will probably fluctuate more yes we my um I had a client recently someone I really enjoy working with and she gave me this term and I I love it see what you think she calls that compersion candy Oh. So yummy. You're like, yes, give me more. <laughs> I want to, I want to hear those details. I want to, I want to eat it up. It's conversion yeah. candy. Mm-hmm. And it's not all the stuff that goes on, but some of it's really, and in, in my research, it was some people, including myself, have an arousal impact. Mm-hmm. Some mm-hmm. person is actively sexually and erotically arousing. Yeah. And so when people are expecting there to be jealousy, but then arousal shows up, they're like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I mean, we don't have to go into the depths of the research to say, well, that sounds like more fun than regular standard issue jealousy. <laughs> mm, I know. So Super you have interesting. individual, relational, and did I, what was, what's the third? And then the third one is social, mm. which is Dang. who are you surrounded with? Do you have people and communities in your life that are supportive of your non-monogamous identity? Mm. Um, because a lot of people don't and it's a struggle you know to push away the internalized mononormativity which is you know the assumption that we we all grew up in that monogamy is the more healthy and the more superior way of conducting relationships so we need books media podcasts like yours you know like role models friends communities to remind us that no okay it's okay to do things differently and that actually promotes compersion when we are able to really be more um self-assured in in that lifestyle in that way of conducting relationships and so we don't have to deal with shame or with that um 
that idea that we shouldn't be feeling compersion, right? Yeah. In in my work, this shows up. I, I often call it internalized polyphobia. There's yeah. this this um, internal pressure that I should I should not really be doing this. So and it and it's a battle inside because there's a very real understanding of not only did I choose this, but I also want it. Mm -hmm. And I'm bad and I should be ashamed of myself. And mm -hmm. a place I see it show up is not just in lack of compersion, but in sexual difficulties. I see mm -hmm. um, penis owners who are like, my erection just will not show up to the party, even though I'm in alignment with all my agreements. Right. Or um, people who are just like, you know what, I, everything's great. I'm dating. And then I come home and I have this, on the way home, I have this like negative tape playing in my head of, what's that? Mm -hmm. And I find that to be one of the big blocks that people like they can't get to the compersion because it's hidden behind this internalized experience of other people's judgment or the fear of other people's judgment, mm -hmm. but it's happening inside. So they don't, it's easier to push back against a, a community member who's like, you're bad. If somebody's mm -hmm. pointing their finger at you, most of us <laughs> run ups are like, yeah, you know what? You don't get to say that. But when it's, when the call's coming from inside the house, Mm. <laughs> this is murky that is murky oh yes and so i i'm hearing that first we can do our we can do our self-worth work we can do our self-love work we can fill our plate like you said mm -hmm. we can do our relational work and and that includes not only the talk we have with our partners but getting support from from our other, the other partners in our life, whether they're romantic or not, all of, I'm, I'm guessing there are lots of sources of that, in that, that reaffirmation that relationship is safe, that relationship mm -hmm. itself is safe. Mm -hmm. And then there's the social piece mm -hmm. and that's possibly feeling very difficult for people. You live in, you're in California, right? Yes. And we live in Massachusetts. Okay. And I, I'm guessing we have very different experiences of in real life community. You know, mm -hmm. Ken and I are out. We're, we're out mm -hmm. as queer and we're out as polyamorous. But we don't have a lot of community in that felt sense mm -hmm. in our real embodied world. We have to really go find it. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. there have been other environments I've been in where I'm like, oh, yeah, I can find that support. I can find those people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How has it been for you to to just exist in the world as a person who seeks out intentional relationships. Do you find that embodied community? Well, thankfully, California and especially the Bay Area where I am is really supportive. Mm. And, you know, of course, there's mononormativity here. Even honestly, like when I started my studies, uh, my studies at um, CIIS, where I did my PhD, it's one of the most progressive universities in the country, if not in the world, but I still felt like there was a level of not um, not mononormativity, but just discomfort around sex in general. Like people mm -hmm. were very quick to talk about you know, psychedelics and um, meditation and all kinds of more like alternative and edgy topics, but there wasn't really a lot of discussion around sex and alternative ways to have sex, which I think is interesting because it is to me one of the biggest elephants in the room in terms of humanity and how we carve our paths. Like we're all carving our individual and relational paths, you know, because we are sexual beings in some way. Reproduction and sexuality is such core to who we are as humans. And, and yet there is such reluctance to talk about it, even in very progressive communities. Yeah, I, I found the exact same thing. I went to Pacifica yeah. and did my mm -hmm. studies, which so CIIS and Pacifica are quite very much like sister schools in a way. They have, there's a vibe, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they're alternative in lots of ways, edgy. And they make space for us. I, I, I have seen a lot of really cool dissertations come out of there, mm -hmm. uh, both of them. But mm -hmm. same thing. I get a lot of pushback about talking about sex, even though I talked about sex in every paper I wrote the entire time. Mm -hmm. And somebody said to me at the beginning of my studies, well, you can either go to the school you want and be the weirdo who talks about sex, 
Or you can go to a, a sexuality program and be the weirdo who talks about Jung and <laughs> archetypes. I just picked, it's like, it's choosing the path. But yes. for me, the sexuality piece was exactly like you said, it was core and central. So I was going to talk about it regardless. Mm-hmm. And it's work like yours that makes, that reaffirms that my, my decision was, was right for me. We need more of this work yeah, I, in the world. I appreciate that both of you have, have done this work and have these conversations because the more people talk about sex, the less people will be concerned about talking about sex. <laughs> So there's no way through it other than through it. And so these conversations out in public help us all um, move forward and grow. Mm -hmm. Right. And Ken, I really appreciated you bringing up privilege earlier. And I feel the same way, you know, as a white woman growing up in Canada and now the United States, and especially growing up in a family structure where my parents were not trying to push me into a mold, right? Because they were already doing the work of letting go of the mold. I feel like I have been in such a privileged position to talk about those things without feeling threatened. And, you know, like overall I've, I've used my privilege to try to push those boundaries. And it's so important for us, you know, who have the bandwidth, like you said, like to, to do that. Yeah. I, I'm inspired to then ask one more question as we start to wrap up. Um, how do you think compersion relates to social change? I mean, oh, I love the change, right? <laughs> and so how can compersion help us? I think just having a word for the concept of compersion can already create a lot of social change because it really brings in that possibility mm. of creating something beyond mononormativity. So I'm not against monogamy, but I am against the default or compulsory monogamous system that, you know, tells us through so many channels that we don't have a choice and that being non-monogamous is somehow unhealthy or not morally sound. Um, And that whole system of mononormativity is built on the assumption that jealousy is the only possible response to non-monogamy. So when you document the phenomenon of compersion, you're really throwing a wrench in the whole system that is a very oppressive and a very sad system. It is oppressive Mm -hmm. and sad. And I, I, something that I say frequently, but I'll say it again, is I rail against the APA's definition of jealousy because they define it as a negative emotion. That is the first word, a negative affective state. And I'm like, who said, who said? Jealousy is neutral until you decide what to do with it. And Mm -hmm. compersion isn't, it is both its opposite and it's not mutually exclusive. Compersion is not inherently always super positive. Like you said, sometimes it's just a a nice baseline of positivity, which isn't the same thing as that, like that rainbows and, and balloons and sunshine, right? Mm-hmm. If we could just take some of the judgment off of both of the terms right. and say, let's invite, let's invite ourselves into a deeper conversation. I completely agree. That's a, that widens the conversation about what relationship even is. Mm-hmm. And maybe we'll actually get to a spot where Mono, monogamous relationships are one of myriad choices. Right, exactly. Really, I think that monogamy, when it's freely and consciously chosen, is can be absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Just like non-monogamy can be. Right. Where the well, key word is consciously. Be. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not just fall into it, right? Right. Right. Oh, I love this. I seriously think I could talk to you all day long. And I, at some point we're going to have to have another conversation, Mm -hmm. Um, but tell people how they can find you. More people need to know about your work. And I'm sure there are going to be people who want to work directly with you. And I know that you offer that as well. So let them know. Thank you. Absolutely. I do offer free 30 minute um, exploratory coaching sessions to anyone who wants to explore relationship and dating coaching. And I work with people across the monogamy spectrum. So if someone is like listening to this, but they're like, I actually really do want to choose monogamy. 
that's great. And if someone is opening up their relationship or already open and wants to cultivate more compersion and understand different ways that they can do that, that's amazing. Um, so they can find me on whatiscompersion.com and they can also download my dissertation there, which is a lot of good info that people can apply into their lives. Or I also have like a very small ebook if people don't want to read 500 pages of academic literature, but it's a very condensed version of my findings. Um, and I also have a more coaching specific website, which is loveinsight-dating.com. Mm. I love this so much. And I, okay, the, all of the links will be in the show notes, but go to whatiscompersion.com and grab the ebook because I actually grabbed it right before our interview because I wanted to remind myself and I had read a good chunk of your dissertation already, but it was great. It was fantastic. As, a, as somebody who loves academic literature, I was also really jazzed to just see how you had really um, coalesced what was a great work, an amazing work, and is a big part of your life's work, I would assume, into something so digestible and so actionable. So go grab that. You need to hear more from Marie. I, I am so grateful that for your work in the world. Thank you for joining us and for sharing your wisdom with our audience. I really appreciate it. It's been it. great. Thank you. Oh, it's such an honor to meet you both. And, and Jolie, I absolutely love your work too. I was so thrilled when I saw that there was a TEDx on this topic and, and that you've got so many good blogs on it as well. So yeah. it's so nice to, to have a partner in spreading that beautiful concept. That's it. That's yeah, it. More great. collaborations to come. I'm certain. I'm certain. Absolutely. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for coming, Marie. Thank you so much to you both.